matter to come before the court this morning is uh, John R. Stowe versus Chuck's Automotive Repair, LLC. Each party will have 15 minutes in which to present the case. The appellant may retain up to five minutes for rebuttal. If the appellant, you want to reserve some of that time, let me know when you come up to the podium. I'm keeping track of the clock and I'll keep you advised of the passage of time. We are being visually and audibly recorded to be posted online, so please try to remain by the podium as much as possible. We yeah, have read your briefs and we're ready to proceed when you are. Attorney Walpole, one on behalf of the appellant, John R. Stowe. I'd like to reserve the five minutes of the money. Thank you. <clears throat> Obviously, this court's aware that this is a, at least the second or third go around in this case before the Court of Appeals. Um, I'm a little bit uh, uncertain as to how to proceed, so I'm just going to start at the beginning and roll. And if you have any questions, please turn on. Uh, this case is uh, John R. Stowe uh, versus Chuck's Auto. There was a lease, it was a commercial property that was leased. Chuck's Auto to John R. Stowe, managing member of uh, RD Contracting. Um, there was a contract drafted. Uh, the contract provided a specific language that the uh, landlord would maintain and perform all necessary repairs to the roof. Um, Mr. Stowe did, took possession of the property, had remained there for some time, <coughs> excuse me, on November 24th. I uh, parked uh, his vehicle, was a small pickup truck, uh, roughly speaking, at a brand new paint job roughly two months before that, a custom paint job on it, parked it in front of the, of the property on the 24th, um, took the van off to work that day off site, came back at the end of the day, and noticed that there were scratches on the hood of the truck on the driver's side portion, and noticed a shingle laying on the floor or on the ground right in front of that uh, the front hood. At the same I just jump back because I had a quick question on okay. the lease itself. Was Mr. Stowe a party to the lease or did he sign in his corporate capacity on behalf of the business? It's a good question, Your Honor. Uh, if you look at the lease, it says John R. Stowe and then it identifies him as managing member. It could have been written SB contracting. It wasn't. Was written to John and identified as the managing member. Uh, I don't believe it's necessarily critical one way or the other. I believe there is enough indication on the document that he was the tenant. Even if he wasn't the tenant, the, the lease agreement specifically provides that he is entitled to repair his personal vehicles, to use the site for repair of his personal vehicles. So he is certainly um, party to that agreement and he's covered by that agreement and I cited the case law to that effect in my brief. Thank so you. either way I think he's entitled to enforce the agreement in this case and even if he was simply an invitee he still assumes the same rights as the tenant. So in any any way of those three formalities he's entitled to enforce that 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 portion of the contract against the, the landlord. <clears throat> He had damage to his truck. He, said, he went around to the side. They noticed that there were scrapes and scratches on the side of the car and another shingle laying alongside. The two shingles were two different colors. One had evidence that it had been stapled to the roof. There was holes in the shingles. The other one had been nailed to the roof. When they noticed this, uh, they looked up on the roof and the shingles standing up on the edge on the roof. Uh, at that point, they took photographs that were time stamped from his iPhone of the damage to the truck, the shingles laying on the ground, and the shingles standing on edge. They picked up the shingles, and cleaned them up, put them in a bag, put them inside the lease premises, tried to call the landlord to describe you know, what he found. Uh, the, the landlord didn't pick up. Came back the next morning, left the truck there, came back the next morning, and took photographs the next morning again damage to the truck and the shingles on the roof the, directly in front of and directly ahead of uh, up above the, the truck and, and tried to call the landlord again. The landlord didn't pick up. They went to work. They left the truck there that day, cleaned up, put everything in the bag. When they came back at day's end, there were additional shingles on the, the windshield and around the bottom of those were pieces and parts, not full sheets. Uh, they picked those up, put them in the bag, um, tried to, the weekend was going to notify them that the parties don't get along, so that, I mean, that kind of went by the wayside. They ultimately got 
estimates on repairing the, the damage. The, the photographs indicate there's tar marks where the shingles struck the car, and then those, the granules on the face slide down, face scratch the, the paint all the way to the metal. So it was, it was not an insignificant thing. Uh, we made the, the vehicle available. To make a long story short, the landlord didn't want to pay for the damage. Uh, we filed a lawsuit, our lawsuit was filed as a breach of contract to enforce the contract provision. Um, according to the law, if the shingles came off the roof and damaged that vehicle, the landlord is strictly liable for the damage uh, because of that provision in the contract. Uh, that was the nature of our complaint. We filed a complaint, defendants answered, we litigated the case. Uh, we put our case on in the chief, uh, put all the testimony on, submitted all the exhibits, the photographs, the shingles themselves, etc. Uh, we called uh, Mr. Hurd, who owns Chuck's, one of the principals, and on cross-examination, cross admitted that he replaced the shingles that day. The, the next day, he was on the roof, he replaced the shingles, and he admitted then a week later, when the defendant's case in chief came up, he recanted and said, no, I didn't replace the shingles. I just reattached the ones that were there. So the, he's testified both ways. They offered the testimony of Mr. Dice. Mr. Dice testified in their case in chief, but if you look at the cross-examination of Mr. Dice, he testifies as follows, that the west side of the roof has the lighter colored shingles. There's four or five areas where shingles, the roof has been repaired, shingles have been replaced. On the darker side, those shingles are old and brittle. There are probably close to half a dozen to a dozen places where the shingles have been torn off, replaced, repaired, patched. Uh, the roof, he said the roof should have been replaced years ago. Uh, his testimony specifically was, I don't know who repaired those roofs. I don't know when the work was done, but it was done since 2014. Since means after. This remind me who Mr. Occurred, Dice was. In, I'm in sorry. This. Remind me who Mr. Dice was. He was the defense expert retained three days before they put on their case in chief. All right, thank you. <clears throat> and the, the importance for that will follow. Uh, but Mr. Dice says he didn't know when the work was done, who did it. In his opinion, the work was not done after 2014. Well, in this case, the damage occurred during 2014. So his testimony is not uh, conclusive that there was no damage or no shingles replaced. We tried the case. Unfortunately, the magistrate made a decision contrary to us. Uh, he said that it was an act of God. An act of God as an affirmative defense was not pled. There was no testimony of it. There was no argument of closing of it. Um, the magistrate came up with that on his own. He also found in favor of the defense saying that we did not prove that the owner was negligent. This is not a negligence case. We have no obligation to prove he's negligent. It's a contract case. He has the obligation to provide and maintain that roof, and if he fails to do so, he's strictly liable. He also stated we didn't prove that the shingles that damaged the truck came off the roof. And we have all of this physical evidence, including the shingles, uh, the fact that Mr. Dice even admitted on cross-exam that the shingles came off the roof, they were stapled and, and nailed to the roof, he, you know, so anyway, he said, well, we didn't prove that we're damaged from shingles from the roof. Uh, at our last appeal, uh, Your Honor, you had asked the opposing counsel, well, if they didn't come off the roof, where'd they come from? And the response was, I don't know. Well, at, at trial, Mr. Uh, Hurd testified, well, they, they came from under the downspouts. Um, and then when that didn't seem to make sense, he said, no, no, I, I'm sure they came off a debris pile on the back None of, it, none of it makes sense. Uh, this is a circumstantial case. Uh, I go back to law school regarding it's a circumstantial when it rains overnight and blah, blah, blah. When you look at this case, I don't 
see how anybody can look at this and say those shingles did not come off the roof and land on that truck. But it's where we are. The court, <clears throat> I'm sorry, we objected to the magistrate's ruling, <clears throat> went back to the trial court. The trial court rubber stamped it and said, well, you're at the God, that, that's gone, you're right. But he affirmed the other decisions. We came to this court and said, he didn't do anything to determine this thing on his own. He didn't review this under the civil rules. <clears throat> this court agreed and sent it back to him. <clears throat> Unfortunately, he filed the exact same order that he had filed previously, except he injected one word, the word independently, in his new order. And in other, every way, shape, or form, that order is identical to the problem. And I stand before this court and say that, that you know, reasonable minds, someone has to take a look at this and say, you know, this decision is wrong. You've got 40 minutes total left. Okay, I'll, I'll reserve the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you. First, I would like to tell you that we have in our uh, brief uh, articulated to my mind very well what our arguments are, and then I will stand on the brief for the, the succinct details of that for you. Uh, second, and this may, uh, I don't know if it will sound a little odd or not, but I'm going to ask you when you are making your review and decision of this case to look at the transcript because I'm telling you that the arguments that the appellant is making in many instances contain misstatements. Uh, what he is talking about, he has embellished. Uh, many of the things that he's talking about are just simply not true. And if you rely on the arguments in their brief and you don't look at the transcript, uh, I don't think that you will understand what went on here. Um, for instance, considerable time was spent in the trial and the appeal talking about things that have really nothing to do with the substance of this case. And, and, and I could spend an hour going through the arguments and the things in his brief, but I don't want to spend my time on that. But I will tell you, for instance, we argued a lot about electricity to the premises. Now, we supplied electrical power to the premises. There was no meter, and they paid $75 a month for that. And they made a big deal out of the fact that the electricity went on and off, and whose problem was that and how was it caused? And, and I've cited that in my brief. Heat to the premises. This was cold storage. There was no heating facility there. Uh, the heating facility uh, that had been used by a previous tenant was not functioning. The only heat that was provided was a vent that was done. It wasn't part of the rent. There was no obligation to do it. But the landlord did that because they had the ability to do it water to the premises. There was really no water except for something that was akin to an outdoor spout. There's no bill for heat. There's a minimum bill for electricity. There's no bill for water. And there was no sink or anything else. It was just a hose like you would use as an outdoor thing. And yet we spent a considerable amount of time talking about that. A porta potty. There was supposed to be no uh, restroom facilities. A previous tenant had let a porta potty there. The clients provided it to them at no cost until the city told them to take it away, and they did, and now we're being complained that we took that away. Repair an overhead door. 
Uh, they say that they uh, had a right to have that done and it wasn't done. A loft ceiling, they claimed, was leaking and fell in. So all of these things that have no real substance or bearing in this case, we spent a lot of time on in trial. Were they part of this breach of contract? Though? No. There was no claim for so them. So it was limited to the car, the damage to the, the car? The, the, the claim is limited to the car. So these were just things that got thrown in here that we had to deal with. There are two issues in this case. Number one is, did these shingles fall off the roof and damage his car? That's issue number one. And, and he would like to tell you, you know, that, there's, that there is ample evidence that that happened. And I will tell you, if you read the transcript, not only is there no evidence that the shingles came off the roof, but there is substantial evidence that no shingles came off the roof. And that substantial evidence is borne by Mr. Chris Hurt, who went up and did the repairs. It was borne by Eddie Dice, who the, the court knows went up and looked at the roof and, and was a roofer for many years. And it was borne out by Google Earth photographs that we had that showed the condition of the roof before and after. So there is very ample evidence that no shingles came off the roof. So where did they come from? There were downspouts on adjacent buildings. There were shingles that were pushed under these downspouts to divert the water. And Mr. Hurt, Chris Hurt, testified that those shingles that they claimed came off the roof and fell on the truck were taken from these downspouts. You know, he's telling you that this whole thing was contrived. And that's what the evidence is. The second part of this is a liability issue. And here we are after all these things that we've gone through, and we are still arguing about the lease and who is the, the uh, tenant. And I will tell you that this court, in its last decision, addressed that. And I'm reading from the decision in case number 28686, paragraph 14. We further note that the lease at issue was made between SP Contracting and Chuck's Automotive. At hearing before the trial court, counsel for Mr. Stowe was adamant that SP Contracting was not in any way, shape, or form a party to the litigation. Consequently, even if the lease did provide any warranty against damage, it would not be enforceable by Mr. Stowe, who was not a party to the lease in his individual capacity. He signed this lease as the managing partner of SPC Contracting. The, the, the rent was paid that way. Uh, the communications were done that way. Everything was done that way. In fact, if you look in our brief throughout the trial, counsel for Mr. Stowe was very clear that SB contracting was the party. But that didn't change until we got to the Court of Appeals and they realized that there was an issue here. So this is not a matter of contract. This is a matter of tort. And we have also cited uh, the proposition that even if, even if, in, in assuming arguendo, that any of the rights from the lease flowed to Mr. Stowe, Chucks still did not breach the obligation of the landlord because there was no notice that there was a problem. They became aware on November 25th that some shingles had uh, come loose on November 24th, and Mr. Hurt went out the next day. The next day he went out and fix these things. So with the cases that we have uh, uh, provided for the court in the lease, th they are not a guarantor. The fact that you're supposed to maintain a lease doesn't mean that, th that it's an absolute guarantee of everything that happens. It means that you have a reasonable uh, responsibility to take care of the premises. I have a question. I know in your brief that you stated that uh, Chris Hurt. Um, he, he went out, or you just said that they went and made repairs the next 
day. Yes. I presume after a rainstorm or storm. There was a storm on November 24. Okay, and but you also said that Chuck's had no notice of any damage to the truck until Chuck was contacted by Stowe's attorney in March of 2015. Yes. So how did they know to go fix the roof? Because they the they're there the the uh, 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 shop for Chuck's Auto was on the other side of the building. So when they came to work on November 25th in the morning, following the storm on the 24th, you could look up and see some of the shingles were standing up. So there was, they had no notification from anybody who just did it? No, there was, there was no notice from Mr. Stowe. He likes to claim in his arguments that the roof was leaking, that, that the, the panels inside fell in. None of that is true. And none of it is in, in the record. And, and, and Mr. Dice went inside and said he didn't see any uh, any evidence of any leaking in the roof. On November 24th, there was this windstorm. Four or five of the shingles stood up, but they didn't come off. And when, when uh, Hertz came to work the next day, they went and put those uh, shingles down and refastened them. If you look at the, uh, the transcript, the shingles that, that were on the ground don't match what was on the roof. And his statements that Mr. Dice said these things, it's not true. Read the transcript. Mr. Dice said he went up there. He didn't see anywhere where shingles would have come off. He did identify the shingles that had come loose. And he said those had been replaced, but they had been replaced long before 2014. They were that way when, when uh, the stoves came to the building. There's no evidence that shows that any shingles came off that roof. There's evidence that contradicts that. The other thing that is so uh, interesting to me is that this happened in November. There was no reporting by Stowe to hurt in November that they had uh, sustained these problems. The first time that Mr. Hurt knew that there was any issue was in March of 2015. Now remember that they were in this property through the November issue. They like to tell you that Stowe was asked to leave the premises. That's not true. Hurt told them that at the end of the lease, which would be up in February, that they were not going to renew. They didn't ask Stowe to leave early. Stowe paid his rent through the end of the lease. Stowe stayed through the end of the lease. Stowe left. Stowe asked for and got his security deposit back. All that time, there was no mention of any problems with these uh, shingles or these damages. It wasn't until March of the next year when a letter was written to them making these claims. Now, Attorney Wolfall indicated that there were attempts to reach Chuck's, but uh, unsuccessful. So and that, that Your Honor, is exactly why I'm saying you need to read the transcript because it's in there. Okay. And what he's saying is not accurate. That's one of the many uh, things that they are that the story gets better every time we go through a new reiteration of this case. So it is our position that the lease was signed by, by Mr. Stowe as a managing partner of SBC Contracting. If this was his personal uh, situation, there would be no reason to identify SBC Contracting. It's very clear from me and from basic contract law who the parties are here. And so the court, the trial court, looked at this as an issue of negligence. Was Chuck's negligent? And there was no showing of that. I mean, they came out the next day and made these repairs. I don't know what more they could have done. There's no strict liability here. There's nothing that flows from that contract to Mr. Stowe. File as a breach of contract action, though. Did the court analyze that? I think that they looked at it, and, and, and in the uh, decision uh, that came out from the magistrate, I think that they found that there, you know, that this was not a contractual matter; it was a matter of tort, and, and, and there was no breach of the duty, and therefore they found in favor of Chuck's. 
And the court was also very well aware of the issue with the existence of SBC contracting because there was a claim that Chuck's filed against SBC and the court said, hey, SBC is not a party here. We're denying your claim against SBC. They're not a party to this litigation. So the court was very uh, aware of Mr. Stowe and SBC and who the parties were that were litigating here. Uh, I, I would be happy to, to ask, uh, answer any other questions that you might have here, but I think that, in a nutshell, is what we have to deal with here. How about uh, the court's mediation program? Have you guys tried to mediate this? No. Your Honor, uh, forgive me for smiling. This is a $3,000 case. We've been well, let me ask again then. Okay. Have you guys tried to mediate this $3,000 case? Uh, there, there was a request for mediation when we went through this before. We're, we're so far past that. Okay. We're so far past that. We had, we've had two days of trial to the magistrate. We've had a day uh, you know, with objections and dealing with those. This is the third trip to the Court of Appeals. Well, nothing uh, recent is a public service case. announcement that we do have mediation. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. And believe me, I, I am a, uh, an advocate of mediation whenever you can. I will tell you, Mr. Walpole and I, before this case even got tried, we tried to settle it. We got very close to doing that, and everybody dug their heels in. And then now, we, you know, my client has spent four or five times the money. This is a three thousand dollar case. We're at the court of appeals for the third time on this. It, it, it just it's mind boggling. And yet, even as we're standing here today, we don't know who the who the proper parties are to this lease. We're still arguing about something that should have been a, you know a matter of some decision at the earliest point here. And with that, we'll have Mr. Walpole address. Thank you. to address one thing I that I do agree with counsel, and that is read the transcript. The transcript, when you have the testimony of, of Mr. Hurd, just keep in mind that you have his testimony on cross-examination, which says that I replaced three to four shingles when he did repair the roof. And a week later, his testimony is I didn't replace any shingles. Read the testimony of Mr. Dice that says, oh, you're right, the, the, I don't see any evidence as is. But then read the cross-examination where he says, there is evidence of repair and replacement of shingles on this side. There's evidence on this side. It's all there. It was all done. I don't know who did it. I don't know when it was done. But I will tell you that the transcript says, specifically, Mr. Dice stated it didn't happen since 2014. Counsel said he said it never happened till long before 2014. That's not true. Mr. Dice says it didn't happen since, which means after. This happened during 2014. His testimony is not conclusive in any way, shape, or form that none of those repairs took place and the shingles were replaced during 2014. Yes, we tried to mediate this case. We offered to mediate. The defendant refused. No interest in resolving the matter. Did my client leave early? No. No. My client had problems out there. You, why is the testimony of electricity heat? Credibility. And one thing in this case, Mr. Hurd comes in and says, never happened. Never happened, because I say it never happened. This is the same gentleman who promised to repair an overhead door and refused to do it. My client did it himself. They were going to put in a concrete pad so he could use his forklift up to, to load and unload things. Never did it. My client did it himself. And he's the one who provided the toilet facilities for the unit until Mr. Hurd said, I got tired of paying for it. It was too expensive. So he took away the toilet facilities. He had water in his unit. Mr. Hurd shut off the water and said, you're not paying for it. He has a water well. 
the only cost is the electric to run the pump to pump the water. It's not city water. My client paid the electric. My client paid for it. Mr. Hurd says, it's not on the agreement. I'm not getting it. He shut his water off. He shut the heat off to the property until the water pipes burst. Then he turned the heat back on. Shortly before this time, he shut the electricity off. I sent the police out. He told me that I'm sending, I've already called the police, filed a complaint, my electrician's coming out. Your client messes with our electric. And I said, so I called. I personally called the police department and said, is there a complaint filed? No. How does that have anything to do with the damage? Credibility. Okay. Mr. Hurd made all these statements of what he did with this electricity. None of it is true. I sent the police out. I sent the electrician out. The agreement was that if you shut that electric off, you're paying the cost. The, the electrician said, Mr. Hurd, you shut the electric off on these people. Flip the switch, turn it back on, and you're paying the bill. And he paid it. This is credibility. Right? Mr. Hurd's one says this never happened. Because I say it never happened. That's the importance of that. The, the importance of who's on the lease, as I said before, the lease speaks for itself. The writing there, and, and Judge Diodoso, you asked the question, I didn't ignore it. The lease speaks for itself, who's on there, the way it was drafted. But the important thing is, in this transcript, you will see testimony where it was specifically discussed between the landlord and the tenant that Mr. Stowe would be allowed to use the premises to fix his own personal cars. He is an intended beneficiary as a result of that, of this contract. By law, he's entitled to enforce that contract the same whether he's the, the, the tenant or whether he's the intended beneficiary. He's entitled to enforce that agreement. That agreement, by law, that provision in there, says the landlord is obligated if he fails to maintain and repair, he's strictly liable. That's the law. That's what we argued in this case. Okay, and that's a year old time. Okay, so thank you for The last thing I would say is there is, when he said that there's a statement in the magistrate's decision that said this is not a contract case, I defy you to find that in that magistrate order. Well, we will review the, you've got transcripts in the case and the entire case file, uh, and we will issue a written decision which we mail to both sides as well as post it to our website and the Supreme Court. So thank you both for your presentation. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor.